Welcome to Bread and Roses. Hi everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Burs Puya. In this week's program, we're going to be talking about the death of a young girl, two years old, at the hands of the Belgian police and the need and demand for open borders. This week's interview is with Caroline Fourier, French journalist on freedom of expression. Our insane fatwa is by the London Metropolitan Police, basically issuing fatwas that should have come or might have come direct from the Saudi embassy. And slice of life are women in Iran breaking gender segregation and entering stadiums. Long live them. Don't go away. Stay with us. Just recently, a two-year-old Mauda with Iraqi Kurdish parents uh, who was born in Germany was shot in the face and killed by Belgian police. Uh, they shot at a van of migrants and uh, really asylum seekers and refugees trying to get to Britain from Germany via Belgium. I mean, it is outrageous. Her lovely beautiful face and to think that she's no longer amongst us and what her family must be feeling uh, she has a three-year-old brother uh, what it's a heart, tragedy it is a tragedy is heartbreaking and this is the result of an immigration policy that sees uh, refugees and migrants not as human beings mm. and they can do anything about it Theo Franken the immigration minister has a history of anti-immigration policy and uh, and drive against Sudanese asylum mm -hmm. seekers, against you know people who are actually trying to cross borders. And he said, uh, getting a ticket on a smuggler's boat is not uh, free travel and uh, access to Europe. This is disgusting, and it is unbelievable that. Mm -hmm. But we know, and we've said many many times that. This end of this policy, this is what happens, mm -hmm. that they are going to shoot at the migrants. But the fact that they say the boats should be returned in the Mediterranean Sea is not a joke. This is what they're going to do eventually. They are going to start shooting at, at the boats of and fleeing migrants. And this is horrendous and unacceptable. Now, we know that as a result of Fortress Europe, so many people are losing their lives uh, at sea. Uh, they're being shot at. They're actually vigilante groups uh, trying to catch migrants as they come into Europe. And now, of course, we are faced with little children being shot in the face by the police in major cities in, in Europe. This is really dangerous and tragic. I mean, you know, Ailan uh, coming and being washed up on shore, the little boy who was killed, who, who died at sea, and now there are children dying and being shot at by European police. And this is, you know, th this is not an isolated incident. Uh, we could see this through, even in Britain, the uh, result of uh, Tory uh, immigration policy. We see what's happened to the British citizens of Windrush generation and this could happen to everybody. I mean the point really I want to make Maria, anything uh, the right wing will do, the anti-immigrants will do to refugees and migrants, they'll do them to the citizens of Europe later on. Make no mistakes. Mm -hmm. This is a scenario not just for migrants and the other people that you, you could uh, you know um, push them aside and make you know make them devoid of humanity actually this is about the future of Europe it's about what Europe is about and that's why it's important for us to defend the rights of the migrants and refugees because we're defending the rights of human beings on the mainland Europe and everywhere else and of course the issue is that look borders are open for so many things for capital you know uh, for birds to migrate for and of course, for the rich, there are no borders for the rich. The rich can get up and move anytime they want and live in any place they want. Migration policies and borders are for the poor and working class. And it's an attack on them, an assault on them. And it's something that needs to be wholeheartedly opposed. And you could see how the right wing, it doesn't matter in what shape or color they come uh, in whether they are the Tory right wing or the neo Nazis or the fascists or the atheist right wing, anti immigrants, you'll see, or you know, 
uh, Christian right or you know even some people on the left because they say too much immigration needs to be controlled and, and managed now all of that they share one thing they are all anti-immigrants and they contribute to this policy of closed borders and it, they are denying human rights to a lot a lot a lot of people mm. and what's interesting is that people want the right for freedom of movement for themselves they're upset if they need to get a visa they don't like it if they have to wait too long in an immigration line they want to travel wherever they want but when it comes to the this right for other people then sometimes people are wary of it and i think one of the the realities is that people are concerned about the effects of migration on the infrastructure of a society, schools, hospitals. There won't be enough if so many people come in. And I think one of the realities is that if you look at Britain, for example, more Brightons left the country than, than entered the country just until very recently. And if we take all the Britons or Brightons, however you say it, who've left the country, um, if they had stayed in, we would need more infrastructure anyway. So. The, the accent has to be, or the emphasis has to be, on the state providing infrastructure for people who come because they will contribute and be a positive, um, you know, Contrib contributory to, force. I mean, to that, society. That, yes. Anybody who says that only the capitalists, only the rich contribute, and the working class doesn't, hmm. it, that's the, you know, that's a reflection of inverse reality. Hmm. The reality is that people who work. People who contribute to society, they are the ones who are making the wealth. So immigrants are, you know, the engines of any society. Any society who accepts immigrants, you can see that the economy flourishes and moves forward and grows. You know, immigrants get the job done, according to Hamilton uh, uh, musical. And that's what it is. And we need to recognize this, that immigrants contribute, labor contributes, actually, Capitalists are the ones are idle and they're not making any contribution to society's life. So this anti-immigrant pol immigration policy, anti-immigrant uh, uh, forces, it doesn't matter how they are, they're atheists, non-atheists, uh, religious, non-religious, right-wing, left-wing, any kind of those, any type of those uh, uh, forces in society that are effectively contributing to denying people's right to freedom of movement. That's why we should be supporting without any if or but open borders. That's yeah. what we support. Yeah. And I think one of the other arguments too is that there's not enough money, you know. But the reality is there is always money for Meghan and Harry to get married, for the Queen to fix her castles, uh, as well as to bail out banks private enterprises you know they keep talking about free market but there's always state intervention when it has to save uh, capitalist institutions like big banks that have messed up the lives of so many people but suddenly when it comes to the nhs when it comes to helping migrants and asylum seekers when it comes to basic human welfare there's never any money yes and imagine for a second that you shut the door of the uh, nhs and hospitals and say sorry Full. We don't have any more spaces for this, and nobody else allowed to use NHS because it is over capacity. No, it's a fundamental right for people to have free health at the point of need, and that's what is. That's the whole idea of NHS. The reality is, it's possible. It needs to be invested. Everybody contributes to society, uh, labor, uh, the working class work and contribute and they need to benefit. In the same way, migrants are actually the most hard-working section of the society and they should be benefiting from all the riches of society because it's their right. So we defend open borders without if or but. Yeah, That's a basic and I think the thing about open borders too is that people will say it's an extreme idea, it's a ridiculous idea. Well, you know, women demanding the right to vote was seen to be extreme and ridiculous. Calling for an end to slavery was seen to be extreme and ridiculous. The reality is that if you look at the right to move as a basic human right, just like the right to housing, the right to health care, the right to an education, the right to live a free free from violence and fear, you can then understand that as a human right, the right to move, the right to live where you want is also an important human right that needs to be defended, not just for the rich, because that's already there, but for the poor, the working class and the majority of people across the world. Now, some people argue that the culture of immigrants and people who arrive in European countries immigrants, yeah. 
is incompatible with liberal democracy and the fundamental you know, sets and norms of the society. It depends on what you promote. If you, first of all, immigrants and those who are running from Islamists and reactionally set up an environment, that's why they come into Europe, because they see, they, they see more compatibility between themselves and the future of their children with the European uh, culture and institution society, that's why they're coming over here, because they want to benefit from that, because they, they think this is what they want to achieve for the children. Now, and also depends on what you promote. If you constantly associate immigrants with Islamists and the most reactionary section of the you know, uh, society, of course you, you, you're going to promote that and you encourage that. But if you associate immigrants with the reality of what they are, that they want to have a free uh, society and a better future for their children and encourage that, then you'll see there's no, incom uh, compat there's no incompatibility between what they want and what the majority of people in uh, uh, European societies want and they live in, in those environments. Actually, this is the culture of the ruling elite in Europe that associate these immigrants with uh, um, with the most reactionary element of society. And also, like anything else, you know, uh, reaction is not stitched in the DNA of someone come from, coming from Iran or Iraq or Afghanistan. And enlightenment values stitched in the D DNA of everyone who's white and born in Europe. We know that's not the case. There's lots of different opinions. Culture is constantly moving, changing. Not everyone has the same cultural values. And in, in the reality is that equating regression with everyone that's fleeing hunger and poverty and war and repression and the religious right is a an absurd position to make yes absolutely and that's why we need to oppose it we uh, defend open borders we want the borders to be open to refugees and asylum seekers yeah they deserve the right It's part of the human rights and also they are the best of the world who are running away from those oppressive en environment and they want a better future and we need to welcome human values equal values universal values the right and what people aimed for needs to be promoted not the most reactionary element mm -hmm. uh, and ideology that is usually associated uh, with the immigrants and finally some people who argue against open borders against migrants against migration policies they're very upset and fragile when you call their position uh, inhuman when you call their position well let's be frank racist uh, you know they, they feel very very sensitive to to hear such things but let's be honest when you defend closed borders you defend the death and murder of countless human beings people who are stuck behind borders people who are just like you just like me who want a better life that's why we came here as well that's why so many people have come to Europe as well you defend that so it is inhuman just because anti-migrant sentiment has become normalized and mainstream doesn't make your position right the right position the human position the position that is a uh, one that belongs in the 21st century is open borders no ifs no buts throw open the gates Okay. Caroline Fred, it's such a pleasure to have you on our program. Always a pleasure to see you. I wanted to ask you about this event. It's Toujours Charlie, Always Charlie. Why is that important after three years? Because it was already painful to explain how Charlie Hebdo is an anti-racist and just secularist newspaper before the attacks. It became completely, uh, really, difficult to, to endure the fact that we have to continue to explain that after their murders. And today, most of the French are still very, very uh, in support with Charlie Hebdo. But still, we read, we are hearing people who continue to be against Charlie Hebdo, but not only against, who are really defaming uh, Charlie Hebdo, uh, trying to say that they are too much, too provocative, that somehow they deserve it. Um, so we need to say that we are still Charlie just because of them. But this idea of provocation for drawing a cartoon, for speaking, and of course this is something that they say about people in other countries yeah. as well. You know, Raif Badawi shouldn't have provoked the Saudi regime. 
explain this? Why is this happening? And why is it so absurd to call it a provocation? I think that when people are too cowards to face the real totalitarianism, the real threat, which is today fanatism, not only today, since a while, actually. Um, they have to find excuses to not resist. And somehow it is more easy to blame those who resist, um, to justify to not join them. So, as you said, Raif Badawi uh, deserve it. Uh, the protest in Iran is not about fanatism, it's about something else. It's always about something else, or it's not always not the moment to face the problem that we have with fanatism. Our fanatics are, are definitely the new totalitarianism. We defeat them when it was from the church. Why we should accept it when it is from another religion? Uh, the, the people who are in this uh, event, they are secularist activists who are also very, very vigilant when the Catholics are trying to fight against the, the right for abortion, are going to put under threats the, the, the women's rights. Uh, okay, why we should um, be silent when there is another fanatism, we do exactly the same and sometimes worse by killing people. But what about racism? Because racism is, and bigotry is a real concern, obviously. It is for you as well. And I know it's also for mm -hmm. Charlie, isn't it? So what do you say to people who say, well, if, if you, when you do this, you're actually aiding the racists and the bigots and the far right? As you perfectly know, it's, it's absolutely the contrary, actually. It's because we think that um, Muslim citizens are just the same as everyone and they deserve to be treated the, the same way we treated the Catholic ones, um, that they can be smart enough to understand the sense of humor, that they can be smart enough to accept that people do not think the same than them, at least in Europe. I mean, we are supposed to be in democracy. So we are not supposed to apply the rules of the most intolerant and sometimes very racist, not sometimes, always very racist fanatics movement. So it's exactly the opposite. It's to be very for equality, that to defend secularism for all, to defend the same law for all. Um, but I'm, I must say I'm really still in shock when I'm reading especially sometimes the British press. I give you just one example. You know it by heart, unfortunately, Maya, but on the Ramadan case, for example, I'm fighting since now, what, 30 years to explain that Tariq Ramadan is a fundamentalist. You can give him a mic if you want, but don't present him as a modernist Muslim. He's fighting the modernist Muslims, calling them Islamophobic or false Muslims. So just I'm asking to a journalist to do their job and say that he's a fundamentalist. And now today also people are realizing that he's more than that. He's someone who is not only having a double standard in, this, in his speech, but in his life. And still, when there is when there is uh, uh, inquiries and, and papers in the British press is most of the time to say that in France we are so Islamophobic that we didn't speak only about Hervé Weinstein but also about Tariq Ramadan. But sorry, it's equality to speak about Hervé Weinstein and also about Tariq Ramadan when there is victims of both of those guys who are claiming to be raped. And what about the victims anyway? Right? Where, where is their say? They are fighting uh, the... No, the but, uh, sorry, what I mean is uh, it's as if victims don't exist. It's only about yeah. defending... Uh, the rapist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the rapist. Uh, it's crazy. Actually, it's crazy. Uh, because, again, I, I, the precaution, the accusation I've heard about, again, those victims who are just saying that they've been raped by Tariq Ramadan, I didn't read it in the press about the victim of Hervé Weinstein. So if there is a double standard, it's there. It's not in the, in the French press where we just try to cover when there is victim of rape. And what about this thing you've said about how you need to fight, uh, you can't excuse one uh, in order to defend another? Uh, do you know, you, you said something about how you shouldn't excuse uh, racism uh, by defending fundamentalism. There is, there is in the left, in certain left, a certain idea that if we want to resist to racism, we should avoid to speak about fanatism because there is this possibility that the danger of fanatism creates racism. But I really do believe that it is exactly the contrary. It is because 
leftists continue to resist to all fundamentalism, all fanatism, that we will, um, we will push away the extreme right, we will show to the people that there is an alternative to the hate, which is secularism. It's a constructive way to resist to fanatism and by the same way to resist to racism because the extreme right cannot have this empty space to say, but at least we are saying the truth about the Islamist fanatics. So honestly, if people who wrote since years that France will elect Marine Le Pen, because I'm, I'm, I'm reading that also in the British and American press since years, that we will elect Marine Le Pen. We didn't vote for the Brexit. <laughs> but they did, yeah. <laughs> the English did. We didn't elect Donald Trump. Trump. <laughs> and we stopped Marine Le Pen. And why is it so? Because we have secularism. Because we have another way to say when there is problems, to face them, not cover them, not avoid them, not deny them, but still to have a constructive way, which is an anti-racist way, which is secularism. Two last questions. One is on the thing where people have said, uh, you know, you're starting a war, Charlie Hebdo, and the sort of <laughs> criticism of starting a war. What's your response to that? It's quite crazy. Already before the Cartoons Affair, the people were able to think that to publish cartoons in the middle of a, a worldwide polemic where Danish cartoonists at this time were under death threats, that it was the cartoonists who were doing the war and not the fanatics who want to kill them for a cartoon. But it's becoming more and more crazy now because they continue to say so. The, the cartoonists are dead. The fanatics are still at rage. They are killing everyone now. And still there is people to continue to say, but if you resist, to those fanatics, you're starting a war. I mean, those people, um, at least, at least, they can keep silent. They don't have to blame the people who are, who are brave enough to do the dirty work and resist, at least. Final question on the protests in Iran. Mm. What do you think about it and you have a message? I am uh, from the bottom of my heart with uh, with the Iranian Democrats who finally are, again, I, we were very moved in 2009 and we knew the bravery, uh, the need to go back in the streets because we know the way it did end the, the first time or the last time. I really do believe, and you know that, the Iranian people are far more uh, Democrats and secularists than their regime actually more, more and more are becoming or atheist or incredibly anti-religious, but maybe more than in France, because they are living under the theocrats, so they know what is the cost of that. We cannot have the bravery um, or we cannot do more than to support them, but at least the minimum, again, it's the question of responsibility for the journalists, at least we need to support them and to cover um, all the images, the footages they are again, brave enough to record, uh, because I really believe that the situation is very different than the Green Movement, that the tension between Saudis and Iran, the, also the Kurd question is very important, because after what the Iranian regime did outside the country, and the Iranian army is outside the country right now, and most of it, um, all the, the energy, the, the outside war, we did cost so much, in a time where the Iranian people didn't have enough to pay, to have their salary to, to eat. And this situation is on the, also at the base of the rage, with growing. And I think that the situation worldwide, maybe this time, can be more um, full of hope than the last time. So let's continue to hope. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. The Metropolitan Police in London seems to have become an, a fatwa-making outfit. What have they done, Maria? What have they done? And, you this know, is interesting. it is interesting because what happened is recently when the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain members went in front of the Saudi Embassy to defy fasting rules during Ramadan in order to 
uh, defend and support those who are persecuted for eating during Ramadan, the Metropolitan Police, four of them, armed with machine guns, surrounded our members and said that they're causing offense. Two? <laughs> <laughs> Yes to, to who? To who? Yes to who? Mm. To the uh, members of the uh, staff members of the Saudi embassy. Oh, poor they things. They get offended because they are fasting. And if you come and protest against, you know, fastifying activity, protest against people who've been lashed in Saudi mm. Arabia, you're offending them. They're, they're offended. And also what's interesting is our members were on the pavement, which belongs to the public and not to the Saudi government. And at the last time we checked... I think British rules apply to the pavement, not Saudi Arabian government rules. Imagine if the word is defined and regulated by offence taken by the Saudi embassy staff, the word would be a different place. <laughs> Let's not uh, allow this to happen. Metropolitan uh, um, Police, please I think you need to think about this. Uh, please don't come and ask us to wear the niqab next time we're on the pavement in front of the Saudi embassy. And maybe get back to doing your job. Yeah? Not the Saudi government's job. That's the job. Anyway. Okay. Oh, doctor, I said to him, I'm going to ask you, doctor, I said to him, one of them is in the head of that doctor, one of them is in the head of the head of my head, and I'm going to eat the head of the head. اونا که پسر بودن بازار سیا بلیت میفروختن مواد باش بود اونا اشکال نداشت ما اشکال داشتون دختریم وزرا بردن که بند کفش تو در بیارو کمربند در بیارو لخ شو سه بار بشین بلند شو خیلی بد بود حالم خراب میشه به اون فکر میکنم حسابم خود شد فرداشم بردن دادگاه یکی با دستبند قاضی پرسید که میدونی جرم ورود زن به استادیم چرا منی گفتم جرم نیست طبق آقا به من بگو طبق مثلا فلان ماده آقا مثلا یه دختر وارد استادیوم بشه یه ماه حبسه یه روز حبسه یه ساعت حبسه گفت که بنویس دیگه نمیام گفتم بالا بازم میام هفته اردیبهشت دارم طرف استادیوم آزادی ما اومدیم و شد. سخت نمیگردم اگرم به فهمن دختری ردت میکنم بری باز کنم دمه گیت اول مهار من دید که این زهر Women in Iran are taking drastic measures in order to oppose gender segregation and they're doing what they can to enter stadiums and the arrests are not stopping them they're breaking all the barriers that it, they are and nothing going to stop them and victory is theirs I mean you could see in a video we've just watched, you know, how confident they are. Uh, Islamic regime cannot stop Iranian women and they will be victorious. Yeah, of course. And, uh, f you know, we do know that the risks they face are great. And of course, from the interview we've just seen, we know that there are huge amounts of harassment, threats, abuse even. And nonetheless, the women are saying, you know, we're going to do it again. We're not going to stop until gender segregation is completely demolished. And they're going to do it, aren't they? Yes, and we'll bring an end to gender segregation and they'll win. This brings us to the end of our program for this week. From me and Mariam Namazi, goodbye. Have a good week.
Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.